Uh, all right. Uh, welcome back after a week long hiatus. It was fun to hear about lots of your projects last week. Sounds like people are off to a good start. Um, so I want to um, begin today with what will be sort of a series of lectures on applications of what we've been doing so far. Okay. Um, so what we've been studying so far are sort of, you know, abstract problems about mean and quantile estimation to various, um, you know, with, with sort of guarantees of various strengths. And, um, you know, so, so why would you want to do such a thing? What I want to talk about today is a sort of very direct application of the techniques we've been studying for quantile estimation to sort of a generic powerful form of uncertainty quantification called conformal prediction. Okay, so these, um, it, once we set up the problem, the applications for what we've been doing are sort of going to be extremely direct. We'll basically just read off all of the results we've been proving for quantiles and, and get corresponding results for conformal prediction. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's an interesting um, set of techniques and an active area of research. So, so um, yeah, it's worth knowing about. So, um, so let's see. So, in general, suppose you've got some model for making black box predictions, and it doesn't have to be a regression model. It could be like a classification model. So maybe you've trained an image net classifier, it sees an image, it tries to tell you um, what is in it, you know, what breed of what breed of dog, what kind of tree, things like this. Uh, but it makes point predictions, okay? Like it says, this is a chihuahua, but sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's a cocker spaniel, okay? So the question is, how should you measure the uncertainty of predictions like this? And, and you know, if we're talking about um, images, it doesn't make sense to, you know, think about like means or quantiles necessarily, right? Like what's the mean of a chihuahua and a cocker spaniel? So the general idea is to, rather than making point predictions, to give prediction sets, to give sets of labels that um, might be the right one. And hopefully the Hopefully, these prediction sets have sort of two properties. One is that they are actually likely to contain the true label. Okay, so we want that, um, you know, with, with some specified probability, the prediction set should contain the true label. And also that, um, you know, ideally, the prediction set isn't like too big. Like we, we don't want it to overcover either. Um, you know, if you if you always contain the true label by just outputting the set of all possible labels, that's not very useful. So, um, yeah, okay, so the goal is to produce prediction sets Um, which I'll write as T, which stands for prediction set. There's a T at the end of set, which we can think of as a function uh, mapping features, which we have available at test time. We see the image to uh, not just a single label like a sort of traditional prediction model would produce, but a, but a subset of labels. Okay, so the um, is the set valued function you take as input features and you produce a set of labels. And this makes sense both in the classification setting where we have a set of discrete labels, say, uh, and also in the regression setting. Like we can also talk about prediction sets uh, when we're predicting real functions, real valued numbers. Um, and what we want is that and I'm going to be sort of um, vague for now about what the probability is taken over, because that's exactly the thing we're going to interrogate as we start applying our techniques here. But our goal is that on new examples drawn from the distribution, the probability that the label is contained within 
the prediction set that we produce should be roughly one minus delta, where delta is our target coverage parameter. So if we want 95% confidence, for example, we want to produce prediction sets that will contain the true label 95% uh, of the time. Okay. So, um, yeah. This this X up here, this chi chi or whatever. Um, it's is. Can you give? I guess I don't really understand this set. I, mean, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So, um, you know, let's. It, it depends what the sort of features and labels are. Mm -hmm. But you know, suppose you know, I don't know. X is you know the set of you know, two fifty six by two fifty six images or something. Okay, so just like pixel values and why is the set of labels there might be these might be sort of discrete labels might be you know i don't know poodle chihuahua golden retriever soup you know, you get the idea, right? Hot dog. Not just one has to be one. You could say it's a golden retriever and also soup. Exactly. So, um, you know, blueberry muffin. So, for example, if you've seen these uh, pictures on the internet like a decade ago, it might you might come up with a bunch of examples for which you're not sure if it's a chihuahua or a blueberry muffin. Okay, so a reasonable prediction set in that case would be a subset of the labels. Chihuahua. Blueberry muffin. And in the notes, I have a bunch of pictures that might introduce exactly this kind of uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I've been having trouble with wrapping my head around about conformal prediction in the context of, because I understand like the concept of regression giving that you did like a constant interval around a region, that makes sense. But it, it seems like in general, like if we have a, a classification model, uh, like multi-classification model, like really the thing that our black box model should be already returning is some sort of confidence score over each of the labels. <laughs> Um, in the set, right? Yeah. So, like, it should be giving, you know, it, it thinks, you know, it's like got a 6% chance of being a chihuahua and a 35% chance of being a blueberry muffin and a 5% chance of being two. Um, so, like, what does this give us that that wouldn't do? Because this seems like a less instructive. Ah, yes. So, um, right. So, the question is, you know, if we have, if we've trained, you know, a ResNet on ImageNet, like, it's not just producing a point prediction, it's producing scores. Um, you know, that sort of sum up to one and kind of look like probabilities, um, you know, the, that they're supposed to mean things like the probability it's a chihuahua, the probability it's a poodle, etc. cetera. Um, so two things. So first of all, in general, those scores are not going to really be probabilities. They're not going to uh, be calibrated, for example. Um, and as we talk about sort of how you, how you, operationalized conformal prediction, we'll need to define something called a non-conformity score that will be, in the case of classification, perhaps naturally built from those scores. So you're exactly right. Like, suppose I wanted 95% prediction, and I knew what was the conditional probability of each of these labels. And, you know, my model tells me, well, you know, like, 90% chance it's a chihuahua, 5% chance it's a blueberry muffin, and the rest of the probability is scattered over the other labels, then yeah, what I would do is I would just sort of greedily fill up my prediction set uh, with um, sort of the most probable label first until the sum of, of the probabilities added up to 95%. Um, in this case, that would be chihuahua at 90%, and then blueberry muffin at 5%. And that would be the sort of smallest prediction interval that has the required coverage probability, we're basically, you know, we'll, we'll see, going to do the same thing, except we're going to um, not just like believe and hope that these scores 
correspond to true conditional probabilities, but but we're going to sort of apply the kinds of calibration techniques on top of the scores that we've already been talking about to guarantee that it actually has the coverage probability we want. So you're exactly right that if our neural network output actual true conditional probabilities of all of the labels, then it would be very easy to come up with prediction sets from those. That would be only a more informative thing. The problem we're trying to solve is that um, the things output by the neural network are not in fact probabilities, but we would still like to be able to prove that we have the coverage that, that we want. Does that make sense? Basically, take the scores, like take them as sort of like extended by scores and recalibrate it. And then that's essentially gonna give us Something like that. So, but, but we'll say that this will, you know, as we talk about nonconformity scores, this will sort of come up like the way you sort of design a good nonconformity score is going to be to sort of think about what you would do if you really had true conditional probabilities to come up with sort of the tightest possible prediction set um, with the target coverage probability. Then you come up with some method for, you know, heuristically producing scores that if you cross your fingers and squint a little bit, maybe you can like hope in your heart of hearts really do represent true conditional probabilities, but you know, trust, but verify, you don't just take that as given you do something with them to make sure that you can prove a theorem saying that you get the conditional probability that you want. But this is maybe like very good intuition for the art of coming up with good nonconformity scores. So for good. a fixed delta, like we're doing better if we can come up with a smaller sets, like more, smaller right? Yeah, like basically your, your goal here, and you know, we'll talk about this a little bit, right? Like you don't want, like, like you know, say I want 90% coverage. So I wanna cover the labels at least 95% of the time. But like intuitively, I also don't wanna cover the labels too much more than 95, or sorry, too much more than 90% of the time because I can always like get 100% coverage by outputting the set of all labels, which is entirely uninformative. Like in order for these prediction sets to be useful, we want them to have high coverage, but also be small. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, so just sort of, okay, this is an example, right? Like a prediction set maps features like an image to a subset of labels like these. But it also makes sense to talk about prediction sets in uh, regression problems, right? These are sort of more like the, the kinds of prediction intervals that maybe you're more, more used to thinking about, right? So I might have, you know, some regression function f from x um, to r, right? So, you know, like linear regression or, or polynomial regression or regression trees or neural networks. Uh, by the way, the strength of these kinds of techniques are going to be that they let you affix uncertainty sets even to arbitrary non-parametric models. So there's you know no reason to limit yourself to linear regression here. Um, in this setting, right? Like we we've got a model that comes up with a point prediction, but maybe what we want is a is a way to sort of come up instead with a with a prediction interval. Okay, so in this case, you know the natural form of a prediction set would be as an interval from A to B. But, by the way, there's other prediction sets, you know, it doesn't, the prediction set for a re regression problem doesn't have to be an interval. It could be, you know, a union of disjoint intervals. It could be, you know, a bunch of disconnected points, but intervals are, are natural. Okay. So, so are there questions about what a prediction set is generally? Right. A prediction set makes sense to talk about in regression problems, in which case it maps on to a prediction intervals that maybe you're sort of used to thinking about, but it also makes just as much sense in classification problems or more generally any supervised learning problem where, you know, you're trying to predict labels of any sort. Um, the prediction is just a set of labels and the semantics we would like to attach to that set of labels is that the real label is at least one of the labels in the set with some specified probability. Okay, does that make sense? And just to sort of emphasize, we want this guarantee to sort of hold, um, you know, basically unconditionally, like no matter what the distribution is, no matter what the generating process is. So even for regression functions, um, like even, even like if, if our underlying model is, you know, like linear regression or something, 
this is a very different form of guarantee than you might be used to if you are sort of used to calculating uh, uncertainty regions around the parameters of linear regression and using that to produce a prediction set because those prediction sets, those parametric prediction sets um, are only correct under the assumption that your model is well specified, that the world really is linear. And so you've been able to learn the parameters. But if the model is not well specified, then your prediction set has no meaning. It has no guarantee that it'll actually cover the label, you know, with the probability you say it will. Uh, we would like to give prediction sets that cover their label with the probability that we say they will under no assumption at all, except that the data was drawn, you know, say IID from some distribution, but we don't care about what the distribution is or if there's any kind of pre-specified relationship between the features and the labels. So in that sense, we're trying to do something sort of substantially more robust than the kinds of standard prediction intervals you might be used to thinking about in regression settings. This maybe is a question that's better for the end class, but uh, okay, that is no problem. But, um, so you can also do non-parametric confidence intervals by like bootstrapping, right? By just uh, like essentially like resampling some of your samples to, to get a sense of what the distribution. Um, like like you don't you don't have any parametric assumptions, but you can sort of like simulate what the CDF of your distribution looks like and use that to generate confidence intervals. Yeah, what um, kinds of actual finite sample guarantees do those confidence intervals have, though? That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked. I have no idea. Okay. Uh, does anyone in this room know? The question is, um, if you try to generate like non-parametric confidence intervals, like via bootstrapping, um, you know, so I don't know what that means exactly, but I guess resample points from the data distribution um, with replacement, you know, a bunch of times pretend these are fresh samples from the underlying distribution and give, you know, some 95% coverage interval. What theorem do you have about that that's not like asymptotic? Is there some finite coverage guarantee? That does exist. I mean, people do do that. Oh, no, I understand. I know it exists. Yeah. Um, but I, I can check. Yeah. What do you mean by modeling fully specified? I mean, like when we run, like in Statistics 101 class, when you learn about linear regression and learn about computing confidence intervals around the regression coefficients, which you can use to give prediction intervals around the regression predictions. It's not just that you are learning a linear model. In the analysis, you are assuming that the world is linear, that there really is some unknown linear relationship between the features and the label. Okay. Uh, if that's not true, then the model is not well specified. So it still makes sense to as a prediction method to, to run linear regression. But um, since there, there aren't any underlying parameters anymore, since the world isn't linear, it no longer makes sense to think about having correctly estimated them. Makes sense? Okay. So this is all to say we want to give like correct uh, coverage guarantees without assumptions. So in like an entirely non-parametric setting about the number that you have or are you just going to like say oh it, it's doing it's not just being silly and and putting them all in one coverage group because we're getting one minus delta not one exactly so, so we're, when we when we sort of analyze the guarantees it's not just that we want the probability that we cover the label to be um at least one minus delta we'd like it to be as close to one minus delta as we can get that's why the guarantees are going to be interesting and non-trivial if we just say we get coverage at least one minus delta you could promise this by outputting the full label set every time and that wouldn't be useful but couldn't we still simulate this by like having by sort of like figuring out like what a one minus delta fraction of the data is and then having like two label sets basically you're thinking about sort of like randomizing yeah uh, yes, you could, and we'll get to that, and, and that's where um, guarantees of calibration are going to become useful. Yeah, so, so at the moment, I think the question was, you know, okay, what, like, we've asked for coverage with probability one minus delta, but like, you know, what is this probability statement taken over? And in particular, like, are you allowed to, for example, randomize your predictions, in which case, you know, this is all to say, 
until I specify more clearly what the guarantee is, it's not obvious that satisfying a guarantee that looks kind of like this will necessarily imply that your prediction sets are informative. There might be ways to cheat. And part of what I want to get at today is we sort of apply our sort of increasingly sophisticated quantile estimation techniques is to um, sort of close various loopholes and make sure that these prediction sets have to be informative and they can't cheat. Okay. Okay, so, um, so prediction sets are cool, but you know, right, you might notice that the set of all subsets of labels is kind of big. And so one problem that you immediately run into is the curse of dimensionality, right? Like, you know, from first principles, if I have K labels, you know, um, there's two to the K possible prediction sets, right? In ImageNet, I think K is something on the order of 10,000. So, so two to the K is just like way too large to even contemplate. So like, how do we think about finding the best prediction set? And the, the way that conformal prediction gets around this curse of dimensionality, sort of the, you know, one of the main ideas of conformal prediction is to introduce what's called a non-conformity score, which reduces this two to the K dimensional problem to a one dimensional problem. Okay, so, you know, sort of the, the, Technique of conformal prediction, you can think about it as number one, identify some one dimensional um, slice of prediction sets using what's called a non-conformity score. And then like do clever things on that one dimensional slice where we can start to use techniques for one dimensional estimation of the sorts we've been thinking of to solve the problem. Okay, so, Like a key idea here is to use what's called um, a non-conformity score function. Which is just some function that I'll call S for score that maps feature label pairs to real numbers, okay? And this can be anything, okay? The, the guarantees that we're gonna give are going to hold no matter what your non-conformity score function are, but whether the prediction sets are interesting or not is gonna depend on you having come up with a, you know, interesting non-conformity score function. Okay, so the role that this non-conformity score function is gonna play is to identify some one dimensional family of prediction sets that we're gonna end up optimizing over. And like it's, you know, on the one hand, the guarantees we're gonna give are sufficiently powerful in general that they will work no matter what the non-conformity score function is, right? That's a merit. But the other side of that coin is that, you know, they don't give you any guidance about how to come up with a good non-conformity score function um, and a lot of the sort of art in practical conformal prediction is coming up with a good non-conformity score function. There's like a whole cottage industry of, of people who, who in different application areas try to come up with especially good ones. And because the guarantees we're going to give hold for any non-conformity score function, trying to come up with a good one can be like a purely empirical exercise if you want. You can use, you can try all sorts of things and use whatever works. And you know, if it works, it's gonna be guaranteed to work. Okay. So what, what you know, like what is a non-conformity score function and what properties do we want it to satisfy? So, you know, in general, the way you will start in conformal prediction is you will have some model. Okay, you'll have like, you know, maybe a, a ResNet model that you've trained on ImageNet that's solving a classification problem, or you'll have a regression um, model. Maybe you've trained, you know, like linear regression didn't work. So you, you know, looked up in a machine learning textbook and you trained some kind of random regression forest and it gives you point predictions, but, you know, like you have no idea how to endow those with uncertainty estimates. And, and so, you know, here we are. 
so a non-conformity score function is supposed to tell you, given an example X, and typically this model you've trained for making point predictions, how surprised you are going to assert to be if the real label is Y. Okay? So, you know, for example, you know, suppose we have a regression problem and what we've trained is some model, um, you know, some regression model that maps feature vectors just to real numbers. What would be a sensible non-conformity score function? Well, maybe the very first thing you would think of, okay, this is sort of the first thing you would think of, and as a result, for reasons we'll talk about maybe a little bit, this is not a great non-conformity score function, but like it's a reasonable one and maybe gets you into the right mindset of what kind of properties we're looking for in a function. Maybe you would decide that the first non-conformity score function you would think of would be this, just the absolute value difference between this proposed label Y and the predicted label f of x. Okay, so it's like saying, you know, I've got this example x, how, you know, given that I think my model is good, how surprising would it be if this label is y? Well, somehow, you know, if my model is good, I sort of expect the real label to be kind of near what my model predicts, f of x, and maybe I'm surprised to the extent that the actual label is further and further from f of x. Okay, so this would be an example non-conformity score function. Now, um, what, what do we do with a non-conformity score function? We wanna, uh, yeah, I told you that a non-conformity score function is supposed to identify like a one-dimensional slice of prediction sets that are gonna allow us to optimize um, over, you know, over this much simpler set of prediction sets. Well. Um, a non-conformity score function parameterizes a one-dimensional family of prediction sets as follows. I'll write it as um, T sub S because it's parameterized by some non-conformity score function. Um, it takes as input uh, a feature vector X and this one dimensional parameter tau. Um, and what is the set? Well, it's the set of all labels Y hat such that when I evaluate the non-conformity score function on input X and candidate label Y hat, um, the non-conformity score function takes value less than tau. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Um, right, so we get an example X. This produces in our running example, maybe um, a point prediction F of X. And um, given any candidate label Y, we get a, you know, a, a non-conformity score, which is just the absolute value difference between um, F of X and, and Y. And, you know, as, I, as tau ranges in general, you know, in this case from like zero to infinity, but in general from like negative infinity to infinity, uh, this sort of, parameterizes like a collection of prediction sets that range on the one hand from, you know, like basically the empty set when um, tau is smaller than any of the non-conformity score, fun any of the non-conformity score values to the complete prediction set that includes all of the labels when tau tends to infinity, right? Like, so in this particular case, if we think of sort of this sort of simple non-conformity score function as a running example, um, what we would have uh, is that a 
our prediction set would just be the interval centered around our prediction, our point prediction f of x that has width 2 tau, right? It would be the interval ranging from f of x minus tau to f of x plus tau, right? Like if this is the nonconformity score function, then these are exactly, this interval consists of exactly the labels whose uh, nonconformity score is less than tau. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so, you know, like we pick some particular nonconformity score function, doesn't matter what it is, but we like kind of hope it's reasonable. And but no matter what it is, we get a sort of one dimensional family of prediction sets uh, character uh, parameterized by this threshold tau that, you know, as we as we range tau from minus infinity to infinity sort of uh, goes from at one extreme, like the empty prediction set, to the other extreme of, of the full prediction set, and hopefully, you know, has some interesting structure in between. So um, these prediction sets are not disjoint. Uh, they're definitely not disjoint. Like in this case, it's they're nested. Yeah, yeah, like in, in general, they're always nested, right? Like if I, right, they have sort of this laminar structure. If I increase tau, nothing is removed from the prediction set and stuff is added. Um, I guess what I mean is fixed tau to preserve points. Yeah. Um, and you have a bunch of prediction sets, right? What, what do you mean a bunch of, I have a, for every X, I have a prediction set trying to guess what is the corresponding Y for that X. Right, like in particular, if tau is fixed, this prediction set. Right, so, so this is a function mapping X to a set of labels. Yeah. So, um, but for any particular X, this, I, yeah, I'll just fix it. I, I think I just need to process it in my brain. Like you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, no, but let's let's clear this up, right? So, so what is the object that we're trying to produce, right? What is a prediction set? It is a function mapping examples, unlabeled examples to candidate sets of labels, right? Because when we see a new example, we want to be able to guess what are the labels that, that are plausible for that new example. And we want this to be a function of the, of the example, because presumably the set of labels that are reasonable for one image are different than the set of labels that are reasonable for another image. This is a, is a family of prediction sets. If I fix a value tau, this is such a function that maps X to prediction sets. In particular, the prediction set is always the set of candidate labels that would have nonconformity score less than tau when paired with X, right? For different values of tau, this is a different function. And as I make tau larger, I get sort of uh, larger and larger sets that the smaller sets are sort of nested within the larger sets, right? But for a fixed value of tau, this just this is a function that maps examples X to predictions uh, that are sets of labels. So for example, in a regression problem, it causes, you know, but like rather than making point predictions F of X, we now give prediction intervals that are like, for in this case, centered around F of X, but have some width that is a function of tau. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, cool, cool, cool. So, okay, so, so, you know, like, this so far is like fully generic, right? You could have like any non-conformity score function, any model F, you know, it makes, everything we've been talking about here makes sense. Um, now, you know, in our like running example, where, you've got a particular like regression model F and a particular non-conformity score function that is just this simple thing. How far is Y from the prediction F of X? You've got a, a particular set of prediction sets and whether or not these are good, you know, whether or not these are like informative depend of course on your choice of the non-conformity score function. And actually this particular choice is, it does not produce super informative prediction sets. Can anyone, give me some 
idea of, of why maybe? Okay, so a couple issues with it. Um, it seems like it's not really taking, like it, we, we don't have a history of control assumptions, but it's not even like looking at the distribution, like or the empirical distribution, right? So these are gonna be fixed width things. You might expect that there's some prediction of that, that you're going to be able to predict a much more narrow confidence interval than other ones. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the problem is, um, you know, what, what is the whole point of like estimating the uncertainty of our predictions? Like, like presumably our hope is that, you know, we're able to tell apart the predictions for which our model is quite confident and is able to make good guesses from the predictions for which our model has wide uncertainty. Maybe we should be cautious in acting on those. And so the way we would want prediction sets to represent that is we would want the prediction sets presumably to be small, you know, maybe even just to contain a single label on the predictions we're quite confident in and to be bigger on the predictions we're less confident in. But if you look at this non-conformity score function, um, the width of the prediction interval is not a function of X, right? Like this will produce prediction intervals centered at F of X of width two tau for every single example. Right, so it might be that we can find a tau such that the prediction intervals do have this semantics, but you know it, it's gonna it, it's gonna be uniformly saying you should have you know uncertainty you know on the order of two tau for every single one of our predictions when in fact maybe like some of our predictions are more accurate than others. It's just not going to be reflected in this in this uh, set of prediction sets, and the reason is because the non-conformity score function we came up with wasn't expressive enough to, to represent sort of variable width intervals. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, you know, let, let me, so, so basically, for most of what we're going to talk about today, like, we're going to show how to give guarantees like this of various strengths, uh, no matter what the non-conformity score function is. But let me sort of take a moment just to, like, walk through some kinds of nonconformity score functions that people think about uh, to address exactly these kinds of problems, just to convince you that like, maybe it's worth listening to the rest of the lecture because we're not only talking about like prediction intervals of fixed width, for example. Okay, so um, you know, the problem here is that our non-conformity score function was built on top of a model f of x that just didn't contain much information. Like maybe we were running, a, maybe f of x was like solving a linear regression problem. And so what f of x is trying to, right, a linear regression problem minimizing squared error. We know that squared error is a proper scoring rule for the mean. And so what linear regression is trying to predict basically is the mean of the conditional label distribution at x. And that is just not informative about how wide our prediction interval should be, right? Like I can have two label distributions that have the same mean, but one of which has much higher variance than another. And so like what I could have tried to do instead is to try to predict the quantiles of the conditional label distribution at X. And, you know, there are heuristic ways to try to do that, just like, linear regression is a heuristic way to try to predict the mean. I say heuristic because it's not, if the world isn't linear, if the world, you know, if, if your model's misspecified, then in general, the linear regression model you learn will not be such that f of x is the guaranteed to be the conditional label mean, but like you can still try it and like it sometimes it might work okay. Right, so similarly, I can uh, run quantile regression Right, which is sort of like linear regression, except what we're optimizing for is pinball loss. And that will, just as linear regression is a heuristic for trying to predict the conditional label mean, quantile regression is a heuristic for trying to predict uh, conditional label quantiles. Again, heuristic because the only time it's guaranteed to work is if the world is a linear function of the features, but it makes sense to try it even if the world isn't linear. Okay. So I could um, try to train uh, 
quantile regression models. Let's call them H of delta over two of X and H of one minus delta over two of X, okay? I can do this by just optimizing pinball loss over the set of linear functions, say, by direct analogy to linear regression, um, where what I'm, you know, like I'm, I'm like crossing my fingers and hoping that this function predicts the, um, the delta over two quantile of the conditional label distribution given X and that this function produces the one minus delta over two quantile. Again, if the world is linear and I'm training linear models, this will actually be true. But in general, like, you know, might be kind of right, but but there's no guarantee that it's going to be true. Yeah, so, so sort of, you know, if what I do is I train a function to minimize pinball loss over the set of linear functions, well, we know from the properties of pinball loss that, um, you know, like the, the constant that minimizes the pinball loss over some label distribution is the target quantile of that distribution. And so if it is possible to express the conditional label distribution, uh, the quantiles of the conditional label distribution um, as a function in the class that I'm optimizing over, then optimizing over that class of function to minimize pinball loss will in fact give me the true conditional label quantiles conditional on X. But that's like that's only true under the assumption that I'm optimizing over a class of functions that is expressive enough to contain the true conditional quantiles of the label distribution, which in general, the class of functions I'm optimizing over probably is not general enough to contain, especially if I'm optimizing over some linear class. So just as it still makes sense to run linear regression, even if the world's not linear, it still makes sense to run quantile regression, but uh, I can no longer have confidence that these quantities really are the, you know, quantiles they say they are. They're just a... Like, like, like why, why run a regression to find quantile prediction? And maybe, I don't know, so, so you can do, like you can, you can generate confidence intervals for quantiles in a non parametric way in general, right? Like you don't, you can get good confidence intervals for, a, for an arbitrary quantile without making distributional assumptions. So, so I'm just trying to. So, so maybe this will become clear as we go forward because that's basically what we're going to do. Right now, I'm just giving an example of like another non conformity score function. But the thing, like, like so far, we haven't talked about what we're going to do to like, take the non-conformity score function and, you know, for example, pick a tau or a function mapping X to tau that'll actually produce our intervals. And the thing we're gonna do is the kind of thing we've been doing all class, which is to give non-parametric um, estimates of quantiles. Yeah. It kind of feels like in, you know, more traditional uh, statistics where you do non-parametric quantile regression with different plots. I think you're right. So, so like what's going to happen ultimately is, you know, once you tell me a non-conformity score function, this distribution over examples, it induces a distribution over non-conformity scores. Mm -hmm. And what the thing we're going to be very interested in is estimating quantiles of the non-conformity score distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, but just to sort of continue, suppose I trained some quantile regression functions for the sort of delta over two quantile and the one minus delta over two quantile, then um, I could consider the following non-conformity score function. And the intuition for this is sort of, you know, like if I believed my quantile regression function, if I believed that my quantile regression function was truly telling me you know, the delta over two quantile from the conditional label distribution and the one minus delta over two quantile for the conditional label distribution, then the prediction interval, 
like I would want to give for x would just be the interval from h of delta over 2 of x to h of 1 minus delta over 2 of x, right? This would have coverage probability delta, because like by definition, there's delta over 2 probability that you're less than this and delta over 2 probability that you're bigger than this. So the reason it's not good enough to just do this is because ultimately in the non-parametric setting, quantile regression is, is just a heuristic, okay? But I can define a non-conformity score function that just tells me for a label Y, a, part, a candidate label Y hat, how far I am outside this interval, okay? So, you know, if I'm out here, I want the score function to be this distance. If I'm here, I want the score function to be th this distance. And if I'm inside, I want the score function to be zero. Okay, it, it, it's just telling, or, or actually probably not zero. Um, I, I want it to be the negative of the distance to the closest um, endpoint. Okay, so um, what I want is that my nonconformity score function should be the maximum of h of delta over 2 minus y and h of 1 minus delta over 2 and y minus h of 1 minus delta over 2. Okay, so um, yeah, if I'm outside to the right, the distance will be this. If I'm outside to the left, the distance will be this. And inside, um, the distance will be the negative distance to the closest endpoint. Okay. Um, and if I do this, then if I look at the one dimensional family of prediction sets induced by thresholding the nonconformity score. What I get are prediction intervals that look like um, H of delta over two of X minus tau to H of one minus delta over two of X plus tau. Okay, so I take the prediction intervals that I sort of started with that would have been a good idea had my quantile estimates been correct. But now what I've what I've done is by introducing this parameter tau, I've given myself the ability to unif to sort of uniformly expand or contract them just in case uh, you know my heuristic quantile estimates were off. Uh, they could have been off either sort of conservatively or aggressively. So I might, in order to get the correct coverage, wanna either expand or contract these intervals, and there will be some value of tau that gets the correct coverage. Um, okay, so this gives me sort of a, a, right, representing things like this gives me a sort of one dimensional knob to turn to be able to be more aggressive or less aggressive in my um, prediction sets. Um, but that, now, you know, in the event that I was able to estimate quantiles, at least in a halfway reasonable way, uh, might give me prediction sets that are that are quite narrow, uh, for examples that I'm confident about and, and wide for others. Okay, so this is, um, you know, a popular method in the literature. Okay, that makes sense. Let's just uh, go through one more example just a, of a non-conformity score that would make sense in a classification setting. Um, okay, so suppose we're in a classification setting like this, right? So the, the labels might be poodle, chihuahua, golden retriever, soup, hot dog, blueberry muffin. Um, right, so it was already pointed out, if I train, you know, a ResNet or some other, model, 
what I get out are actually not uh, just point predictions, but I actually get out sort of a score. Like I get out for every label, um, a score that kind of looks like a probability, a probability that, you know, this is a golden retriever or the probability that this is soup. And when I say it looks like a probability, I mean, it's like a number between zero and one such that these scores sum to one. Okay, so if you don't want to think about neural networks, just think about logistic regression or something, which is, um, you know, just like a depth one neural network. The thing you get out at the end of logistic regression is of the, you know, for multi-class logistic regression is of the form of a probability. But like, again, if your model's misspecified, it's not really a probability, it's just a number. Okay. But, um, you yeah, know, maybe sort of it's instructive to think about how we came up with a good non-conformity score in the regression setting, we sort of said, okay, suppose the model that you've learned, in this case, the uh, quantile regression model was actually right. Okay, what would you do if it was right? Well, this is the prediction interval you'd want if it was right. And now we want to sort of give ourselves some kind of one-dimensional knob that is expressive, you know, that is on the one hand expressive enough to encode the correct thing to do in the event that our model was right, but on the other hand, allows us to arbitrarily um, sort of widen or um, narrow our prediction sets um, to a sufficient degree that we can get the target coverage we want for some value of tau. Okay. So like, what would we do in a prediction setting if we really had the conditional label um, probabilities. Okay, so let's suppose that we have this function um, star sub x y that actually tells us what is the probability um, that the label is y uh, given that the features are x. Okay, so like what's the probability this is really soup? Okay, so in this case, what we would want to do to come up with the smallest 90% prediction set is we would want to sort the labels by their probability, right? Like there's whatever is the most likely label, then whatever is the next most likely label, then whatever is the third most likely label. And we'd start wanting to include them in our prediction set uh, in, in sort of decreasing order of their probability, right? So it might be that there's some label that already has more than 95% of the mass, in which case we're in the ideal case. The prediction set is, you know, just this, single label, like this is definitely a blueberry muffin, right? But it might be that, you know, we're aiming for 90% coverage and we only have 89% confidence on blueberry muffin, uh, but we have, you know, the next label down the list, 2% uh, is Chihuahua. And so now we include these two labels and this is like the smallest prediction set that has at least 90% coverage. Right, so if our goal is to produce the smallest prediction set that has at least the target coverage, then the thing we should do is we should sort the labels by their probability of occurring and start including them in the prediction set in decreasing order of this probability until we hit the target coverage. Okay, or more generally or you know, more formally, um, let's let the permutation uh, pi of p star of x um, order labels in decreasing order of probability okay so you know, like by assumption, what this means is that if I look at the probability of the label that comes first in this permutation, 
this has higher probability than the label that comes second in this permutation and so forth. Okay, so just decreasing order of probability. And let's define the function C T of this probability estimate to be the cumulative probability of the first T labels in this sorted ordering. Okay, so C T of P star, it's just going to be the sum I equals one to T of the probability that the ith label in this sorted ordering has. Okay, so if, if uh, you know, blueberry muffin is the most likely label and uh, chihuahua is the second most likely label, then C1 is just the probability of blueberry muffin. C2 is the probability of blueberry muffin plus the probability of chihuahua. Okay, so it's the cumulative probability of the top T labels in the sorted ordering. Say? The, the probability of Chihuahua is like eight. Well, they can't be, they can't sum up to more than one. Okay. So, so probability of blueberry muffin could be 89, probability of Chihuahua could be two, and then uh, C1 would be 89, C2 would be 91. Okay. So then, um, you know, like the, the smallest prediction set that has the target coverage, if we really had these conditional probabilities, that would just be the following prediction set that includes all of the labels such that if I look at the cumulative probability of the labels ranging from sort of most likely to wherever this label shows up in the sword ordering. That should have coverage probability um, at most one minus delta. Okay, so this is sort of just a, for now, confusing way to write I want to include all of the labels such that um, if I if I sort of included the labels in sorted ordering from the most likely to this one, the probability would not yet be one minus delta, right? So when I'm generating the sort of smallest prediction set, I have to go beyond this label to get coverage one minus delta. Okay. Now the reason to write it in this way is because this corresponds to a prediction set of this form. We've got like a number that we can evaluate if we know um, X and a target label, and we want to include all of the labels such that, such that this number is less than some threshold, one minus delta, okay? Now, this is what you would do if you actually had the conditional label probabilities, right? Just as this is what you would do if you actually had the conditional label quantiles. Now, in general, these kinds of quantities are out of reach. The distribution might be complicated, but we can still act as if the thing that we have learned are the true conditional label probabilities, okay? So, you know, suppose we've got some neural network. It outputs scores, right? So in particular, it gives us some function 
that looks like this. For every example X and every candidate label Y, it gives us a number that sort of purports to be a probability, but might not be. We can use these to define a permutation just as we would have done with the true conditional label probabilities. We can define this cumulative probability function C just as we would with the true conditional probabilities. And we can set our non-conformity score function to just be this. The cumulative probability of the label ranked from one to the ranking of label Y under these guesses for what the marginal probabilities of the labels are. And now the prediction sets that are generated from this non-conformity score function look like this. And if we were correct and our neural network worked amazingly and really learned the true conditional probabilities, then this would be an expressive enough family of prediction sets to have the optimal prediction sets in there, right? Like we would just set tau to be one minus delta. But uh, if somehow things didn't work perfectly, this knob not only allows us to sort of recover the optimal prediction sets in the event that things work perfectly, but allows us to sort of uniformly uh, make these prediction sets smaller or larger. And so there should be some setting of tau that gets the correct coverage. Okay, so, so this is sort of the general idea of conformal prediction, that what you do is you sort of, you know, have a good idea in the shower or something for what might be a good way to come up with prediction sets. You know, it's the non-conformity score function. We don't care what it is. It just, you know, like uh, you know, the important property is that it's one dimensional and whether it's actually a good one or not, you know, that's potentially an empirical question, but um, you know, like maybe at least it should be based on some something that would be sensible if you knew the true distributional properties. Okay. Um, and then, right, you've got this one dimensional family of prediction sets and all of the rest of the work is coming up with good prediction sets in this family. Okay. And the strength of conformal prediction is that, you know, the, the non-conformity score function can be anything. It can be based on any model, you know, be however complicated, however many bells and whistles you like. We don't need to make assumptions about either what the model looks like or what the true distribution looks like, what the world looks like. Once you have the model, you can come up with any nonconformity score function you like. And so for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to like not care about what the nonconformity score function is and just give guarantees. Uh, you know, I'll assume you give me some non-conformity score function and we're going to aim to get coverage guarantees. But like we should be reminded that um, these will be most interesting if you come up with a, a clever non-conformity score function. What we're going to promise is we will get the correct coverage guarantees for any non-conformity score function. But if you want the prediction sets to be informative, you additionally are going to want to have like a good non-conformity score function. But the strength of having sort of um, guarantees, coverage guarantees that hold for any non-conformity score function is you can sort of decouple these two things, right? Like you can have the freedom to investigate different non-conformity score functions at your leisure without worrying about coverage guarantees if you have techniques that can take arbitrary non-conformity score functions and, and give them the correct coverage guarantees. Just like uh, conformal prediction, but not as a pure prediction, because uh, for causal inference, we are not interested in the prediction itself, but we are interested in the difference of the algorithms. So you have like the choosing variable, and if it's one, you have one label, and if it's zero, you have another label. And we're yeah. interested in the difference between them. Can we do something like this? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to, I guess, specify a little bit more what you meant. Like, for example, maybe what you want is that I sort of predict the outcome as a function of the treatment and then yeah. and then I want that the set should contain but like do I want that the set should contain the true label 90% of the time 
no matter which treatment I choose um, or for just one of the options. Anyways, th maybe there's different ways you could formulate this, but, and, you know. So for example, I'm interested in the difference as a number. So in some sense, yeah, so I guess the, the but like maybe, it's just, the short answer is I, I suspect some of these things are relevant and I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, you know, the thing about the difference in effect if you treat versus don't treat is that's not observable. Um, of course, if you promised that the, you know, prediction set would get the you know, the, the prediction set, which would now be a function, both of the features and of the intervention would get the correct coverage sort of for every intervention, then maybe you could work out from that something about the difference. A anyways, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> I don't, yeah, that, yeah, 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 like no, nothing I say today will be uh, directly applicable to causal inference, but um, I would guess if you type into Google like conformal prediction causal inference, you might find some results. And even if you don't, I bet that you could come up with some results. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. So from now on, I'm going to, you know, so, so like this part was just sort of, you know, rah rah conformal prediction. Um, these were examples of non conformity square functions that people use. But from now on, I'm not going to care about the details of the non conformity square function. Like, it's just some function from now on, and we're going to give guarantees no matter what it is. So I'm going to start out with, given the content that we've covered in this class so far, what I will describe as a very weak guarantee. But actually, this is the main guarantee considered in the conformal prediction literature. And then I will go on to consider stronger guarantees that are applications of the things we've learned in this class. But like this weak guarantee that I'm going to start with, this is what people usually mean when they say conformal prediction. And you can consider conformal prediction either in the batch distributional setting where data is drawn IID from some distribution or in the sort of or in the sequential adversarial setting. Um, we're going to consider both because we've given techniques for both settings here, but let me start in the sort of batch distributional setting where this is again the most common setting considered in the literature where it's assumed the data is drawn IID or is at least exchangeable, which just means that the sequence, that the probability of any sequence of outcomes should be permutation invariant. Okay. So the problem set up is that we've got some data set D, which I'll call a calibration data set, drawn from some distribution. Okay, it consists of n points drawn, let's just say IID from this distribution, although that's a little bit stronger than we really need to prove the theorem. Um, and our goal is to come up with a prediction set as a function of this D. Like we get to look at the data sets in coming up with the prediction set, but we'd like to come up with a prediction set as a function of this D that satisfies marginal coverage in expectation. Okay, so what do I mean by marginal coverage in expectation? So we want to find some prediction set parameterized by D that maps features to subsets of the labels such that if I look at the expected value over the draw of the calibration data set of the probability over a fresh sample drawn from the underlying distribution, that the label is contained within the prediction set that I came up with as a function of D, that on the one hand, this should be at least one minus delta, should be at least the uh, target coverage probability, and on the other hand, shouldn't be too much larger. Should be at most, let's say, 
one minus delta plus one over n plus one, where n was the number of samples. Okay. So this is sort of the thing that people typically try to do um, in what's called split conformal prediction. Okay, and where does the word split come in? Well, we're going to have to assume that whatever our nonconformity score function is, um, it is not correlated with, you know, it's defined independently of the sample D. And so in particular, if our nonconformity score function is based on some model that we had to train from data, that means we had to train it on data that was different from this calibration set. So typically, if you had like a bunch of data, you would split it into like a training set and the calibration set. And so that's why the method I'm going to describe is called split conformal prediction. Okay, and the reason this is a weak guarantee, right? Marginal coverage in expectation. Right, it's because of the words marginal and in expectation. Right, so first of all, this inner probability is a marginal coverage probability, meaning the randomness is taken over both X and Y. It doesn't mean that for you as an example X, there's a 90% chance that your label is contained uh, in the prediction set. It means on average over all of the people we make predictions over, we cover 95, we, we cover 90% of their labels. Okay, so we might overcover on some subset of the population and undercover on the complement of that subset. That's not ruled out by a marginal guarantee. And it's a marginal guarantee in expectation because. You know, like the prediction set we come up with is a function of the training data set, the calibration set. And this guarantee isn't a high probability one. It doesn't say you're you're very, very likely to have, you know, one minus delta coverage. It says in expectation over the randomness, you know, the expected coverage rate is, is one minus delta. Okay, so those are the two things that are sort of weak about this standard guarantee that we're going to try to um, strengthen. But let's let's sort of cover the standard case first. Okay, questions about that? No, you don't want it to go as high as possible because then you just include all the labels, right? Like getting covered one is not interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like, like basically, Right, if I have something that looks really, really, really like a blueberry muffin, like I'm 99% sure it's a blueberry muffin, but like, you know, never say never. So like there's, you know, it's not like a measure zero event that it's a chihuahua. Um, what I would really like is, is for the prediction set to just say blueberry muffin. This thing is definitely a blueberry muffin. If I just wanted coverage rate at least one minus delta, then, what the algorithm could do while satisfying this guarantee is output all 10,000 labels in ImageNet, and this would not be useful. So I want, you know, like if I want to be like really certain, you know, I want like 99%, at least 99% coverage, because I don't want to bite into a chihuahua that's gross, but uh, I don't want 100% coverage. <laughs> like I, I want to allow that, you know, I'm willing to like bite into the thing, even if there's some vanishingly small chance that it might bark. <laughs> yeah, does that make sense? What do you mean? And Include all of them plus one. Like, like we we want to like define some like objective such that if we satisfy it, we're likely to have an informative interval, an informative prediction set. Right? There's other ways to cheat here, and we're going to address those shortly. But like. If you just said you wanted coverage at least one minus delta, there's sort of no constraint here that the thing that you're getting is going to be informative. There's other ways to specify this, right? Like we could set this up differently. We could say, I have no upper bound on coverage, but what I want to do is I want to minimize the average size of the prediction set subject to the constraint that the prediction 
coverage rate is at least one minus delta. Now, that would probably end up giving a guarantee that was a lot like this, because if I wanted 90% coverage and you were giving me 95% coverage on average, those probably aren't minimum size prediction sets because you could shrink them at the cost of some coverage. So, so the solution there would probably look a lot like the solution here, but, but this is one reasonable thing to ask for. Make sense? Yeah, so you're saying that if we put some like limits on the size of the we want to end up with the same parameter. That's right. Like, uh, that, that's not like a, a theorem, but I'm saying like, an, like another way to ask for informative prediction sets would be to say, find me the prediction sets uh, amongst all of the prediction sets may be parameterized in this one dimensional family by a non-conformity score. Find me the sets that on the one hand satisfy coverage at least one minus delta and amongst all of those find the ones that have smallest average size. I'm saying those for any continuous non-conformity score distribution at least would have coverage probability essentially exactly one minus delta. Because if it was larger than one minus delta, I could shift the threshold downwards and smoothly make the prediction sets smaller while reducing the coverage probability, which is the thing that I would do to optimize my objective subject to this one dimensional um, you know, coverage constraint. Make sense? Yeah. But that's not to say that that's not an interesting formulation. It's a, but, but this is, you know, this is one reasonable formulation. Well, you don't want to like, like you can't like limit the size of the prediction sets because it might be that your model is terrible and is very uncertain and to have target coverage, they need to be huge. Um, like in general, like say we've got a continuous non-conformity score distribution. Um, you know, so maybe the regression setting is like the easiest one to keep in mind where we're just giving like prediction intervals. Um, there's this continuous monotone relationship, but like once we've restricted to some one dimensional family of prediction intervals defined by a non-conformity score function, there's this like monotone relationship between tau and prediction set size and coverage probability. As I increase tau, I sort of increase coverage probability and size both monotonically. So, you know, sort of the, when you have this one dimensional knob tau, like that knob is simultaneously controlling prediction set size and coverage probability in the same way. Now, when it comes to choosing the nonconformity score, then there's an interesting trade off, right? Like for, for sort of better nonconformity scores, you'll be able to get the target coverage with smaller sets. But that's sort of outside the design space we're thinking of now. Like we're going to think about what you can do once someone gives you a nonconformity score. Okay, so this is a weak guarantee, um, but it's very easy to achieve and it gets sort of very good quantitative bounds in the sense that um, our over coverage rate here is sort of the best you could possibly hope for, which is just sort of like one over your sample size, which is basically like, that's like the discretization error of quantiles when you have a um, sample of size N, right? Like there just don't exist empirical quantiles outside of, you know, one over n, two over n, three over n. Okay, so it's sort of unavoidable to have this kind of error. Um, and on the one hand, this is a very weak guarantee. It's marginal, it's an expectation. But on the other hand, the quantitative convergence is about as good as you could hope for. And the algorithm is dead simple. The algorithm is very, very easy to run, which is why this is a pretty popular technique. Okay, so what is it? I'll call it split conformal. It takes as input a calibration data set D, a non-conformity score function S, and a miscoverage target delta. It says, okay, yeah, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to find the one minus delta quantile on the empirical distribution. And that'll be our tau. 
and that's what we'll use for the prediction sets we output, and that's it. Okay, the only catch is because it's sort of a, um, you know, the, the empirical um, distribution um, is, is this like discrete distribution and quantiles are this funny step function. We'll need like a, like a small bias correction term. So we're not actually gonna wanna literally find the one minus delta quantile on the uh, data set. We'll wanna find something just a little bit bigger than that that'll sort of correct for sampling bias. Okay, so we're gonna let tau, this threshold that we're gonna pick, be the smallest value. such that the sum, my equals one to n, the sum over all of the data points, the indicator that the non-conformity non score function evaluated on each of the data points uh, at their true label, is at most tau, uh, we want this to be at least one minus delta times n plus one. Okay, so tau is an empirical one minus delta times n plus one over n, the ceiling here, because it has to be an integer quantile of the distribution. Okay, so it's basically a one minus delta empirical quantile, except like actually it's a little bit bigger than that. It's like one minus delta times n plus one over n empirical quantile. And since, you know, things are discretized, like, um, you know, the numerator has got to be an integer. Okay, so we're, but we're, we're basically just finding um, the empirical quantile that is sort of, morally speaking, if you squint, the one minus delta empirical quantile on this distribution. And we're using that. We're outputting the prediction set function that just contains all labels y hat such that the nonconformity score on x paired with y hat is at most tau. Okay, that's the algorithm. Very, very simple. You've got your nonconformity score. You've got your calibration data set. You find the empirical, you know, 90th percent quantile on the calibration set. And now your, your prediction set is just going to be the set of all labels whose nonconformity score falls below this empirical quantile. Okay, is the algorithm clear? So super simple. And the claim is going to be that um, the super simple algorithm outputs a prediction set that has exactly this guarantee. Okay. That under the assumption that the data is drawn IID from this distribution D. In fact, all we need is that the sequence of data is exchangeable. We'll see this is what we use in the proof. Um, that in expectation over the draw of the data set, the prediction set that we output, which is a function of the data set, will have coverage rate on new, dis on new um, data points from the same distribution that is bounded between one minus delta and one minus delta plus one over n plus one. Okay, is the statement clear? And the strength of this theorem is that it doesn't care what the nonconformity score function is. And so implicitly, since nonconformity score functions are defined by whatever like underlying prediction technology you have, doesn't care what 
that is either. So this is a way to attach uh, non-parametric prediction sets to any prediction method that has this guarantee uh, with no further assumptions. Um, okay, so what are the assumptions? Well, okay, I want the data to be drawn IID from this distribution. Actually, I just want the sequence of data observed to be permutation invariant. And um, just to like, for like this part, actually, it's important that there are no ties, that there's no two points that have the same non-conformity score function. And so one way to require that hold with probability one is to assume that the non-conformity score function uh, is continuous, but that's actually stronger than we need. Like, I just need that the non-conformity scores are unique in the sample. So you could perturb them, for example, with a little bit of continuous noise to achieve that. Okay, so let's prove the theorem. This is the theorem. Okay. So without loss of generality, let's um, renumber the samples in D um, in increasing order of their nonconformity scores. Okay, so by that I mean, you know, whichever point has smallest nonconformity score, I'm going to call that point one. The thing I call point two is the thing that has second smallest nonconformity score. These are strict inequalities because the we're assuming there's no ties. And the thing that I call Point N is the thing that has largest nonconformity score. These are nonconformity scores evaluated on the features and their actual labels. Okay. So, um, you know, one thing to observe here, right? Like I said, let tau be the smallest threshold such that um, the number of points that are who have nonconformity score strictly or not strictly weakly below the threshold is at least something. Okay. So the threshold I'm going to pick is going to be exactly the nonconformity score for one of these points. Right. Because if, if I picked something between two nonconformity scores, I could shift it a little smaller and I wouldn't change, uh, I wouldn't change this number at all. And so you know, the thing I picked must not have been the smallest. So the thing that I picked has to equal the nonconformity score for one of these points. Okay. So um, let's give a name to the point that it equals. Right. So um, let's let I star be the index such that um, the nonconformity score for point I star equals tau. And note, we, we know what this index is. I star is just the ceiling of one minus delta times n plus one. That was like by construction. Um, how we came up with tau. Okay. So now let's consider a new point. Let's consider a new point xy freshly sampled from this underlying distribution, the same distribution from which our calibration set was sampled. Um, and let's consider the augmented data set D prime 
which is just D union this new point. Okay, so this is a, a, an augmented data set. Our calibration data set had n points. D prime has n plus one points. Okay. Well, all right. Um, you know, XY is a point freshly sampled from the distribution. So what we're interested in is the probability that um, Y is covered by the prediction set that we've produced uh, for X, which is by construction, exactly the probability um, that the non-conformity score um, S of XY is less than or equal to tau, which is just the probability that if we put D prime in sorted order, that this point XY shows up before the point I star in the sorted order. Right, because the point I star is the point that has nonconformity score equal to tau. When we put the points in sorted order, everything before I star in sorted order has nonconformity score less than tau, and so is covered by the prediction set. Anything after I star in sorted order has nonconformity score bigger than tau and is not covered by the prediction set. Okay, so this is just equal to the probability that I shows up in position less than um, I star when D prime is sorted by a nonconformity score value. Okay. Does that make sense? That's sort of like the key conceptual thing. Right to the, just to say it again, this new point xy will have the label covered by our prediction set by definition exactly when its nonconformity score is less than tau. Tau is just the nonconformity score that shows up uh, in position i star in sort when we put the points d in sorted order by their nonconformity score. Okay, so when we put the points d prime in sorted order by their nonconformity score, which just requires taking you know this one new point xy and putting it wherever it's supposed to go in sorted order, that's just the event that this new point shows up in sorted order before position I star. That's the same thing as the event that the nonconformity score is less than tau because the nonconformity score for point I star is tau in sorted order, everything before it is less than tau. Everything after it is greater than tau. Yes? Okay. Now, Okay, now D prime, if I look at the distribution on D prime, this, you know, it's drawn from, it, it consists of N plus one points drawn IID from the same distribution. It's D was drawn as N points drawn IID from the distribution and XY was just one more point drawn from the same distribution. Okay, in particular, um, like by symmetry, Right, because sort of basically all permutations of the data sets are are equally likely. Um, right, like like everything's symmetric. All of these points are drawn IID from the same distribution. So there's nothing privileging. It, there's nothing biasing X Y this new point to show up in any particular place in the sorted order. Right, these these by symmetry, like the chance that. XY shows up, you know, has the smallest nonconformity score is equal to the probability that 
xy has the second smallest nonconformity score is equal to the probability that xy has the third smallest nonconformity score and so forth, just by symmetry. All of the points are the same. So there's no reason it should be closer to one position in sorted order than, than anywhere else. So. Sorry. That's, sorry, that's a good question. But that, if, does that assume any distribution? I mean, because when you. It doesn't assume anything except that the points are drawn IID from the, from the same distribution. So I don't care what the distribution is, because but. I, one, then. Exactly. Yeah, just a symmetry yeah. argument. So if you remember points that John IID from ABCD, and then you are arguing that the order of their uh, nonconformity score is Really like uniform at random between all of them? That's what you're arguing? I'm saying that um like any single point that you've drawn IAD for this distribution could is equally likely to have shown up anywhere in this list of yeah. So here's here's what I'm saying. Like suppose each of you suppose you know I give each of you a random number drawn from some distribution. Okay, doesn't matter what the distribution is, but I give each of you a random number drawn from the same distribution. Okay, then I ask, okay, what is the probability that Ira has the smallest number? And I ask separately, what is the probability that Natalie has the smallest number? Well, you guys are the same. You drew the number from the same distribution. So it must be that the probability that Ira had the smallest number is the same that the probability that Natalie had the smallest number is the same that the probability Myra had the smallest number is the same for every single person in the room. Right. And so the, okay. And, and those sum up to one. And so if there's N people in the room, by, since I know those are all the same quantity, whatever it is, and they sum up to one, it must be one over N for everybody. Okay. So the probability that any one of you has the smallest number, if you drew numbers from the same distribution, it's one over N. Similarly, the probability that any of you have the second smallest number or the third smallest number, just by symmetry and the fact that probabilities sum up to one. Okay, so here we're just asking that question. We have n plus one points that drew nonconformity scores, which are just random numbers drawn from some distribution, and they're all drawn from the same distribution. That's the IID assumption. Okay, and we're just asking what is the probability that the point shows up before index i star. Um, and it's the same for every point. Right? Okay. Which means what is the probability that the label is contained in the prediction set? Well, it's the probability that in sorted order, the non conformity score. Uh, for point x, y shows up before i star in the sorted ordering. Okay, so it can show up in position one or position two or position three, all the way up to position i star. Okay, there's n plus one points. So this is i star over n plus one. Okay. Now, i star is one minus delta times n plus one, the ceiling of that over n plus one, or sorry, i star is one minus delta times n plus one, uh, the ceiling of that. Well, the ceiling can only make the thing bigger. So this is only bigger uh, than one minus delta times n plus one, over n plus one, which is, well, n plus one over n plus one is one, so that's one minus delta, okay? So on the one hand, the coverage probability um, is at least one minus delta. On the other hand, you know, we can continue this derivation here. Um, you know, the ceiling makes things bigger, but it can't make them bigger by more than one. Right, it just rounds up to the nearest integer. So this is also at most um, 
one minus delta times n plus one plus one over n plus one, right? Like the ceiling made things bigger, but not by more than one, um, which is just one minus delta plus one over n plus one. Okay, which is the guarantee in the other direction. Okay. So that establishes um, that this very, very, very simple algorithm gets the target coverage very, very closely, uh, you know, coverage at least one minus delta and no more than that by, you know, no more than one minus delta plus one over n plus one. Um, under very mild assumptions, we assumed nothing about the nonconformity score. We did assume the data was drawn from some symmetric in, in some symmetric way. So we needed that everyone was equally likely to be in the first spot. Everyone was equally likely to be in the second spot. IID is sufficient for that, but you can weaken that a little to exchangeability. And we recovered. We, we required in this argument that there were no ties. Like if we want to get this one over n plus one, it's important that there's no ties. And so. Um, if the nonconformity scores are drawn from a continuous distribution, for example, that'll be the case. Okay, so why don't we take a, a 10 minute break now, it's 3.30, let's reconvene at 3.40, and we'll start thinking about how to apply what we've been doing to get somewhat stronger guarantees. Okay. Um, so we all sort of get what conformal prediction is. And, uh, you know, so this is the standard split conformal prediction algorithm. This is the standard guarantee it gets. What I want to do for the rest of the class is basically just march through everything else we've done in this class from lecture one until now, apply it to, this is why I made us do everything for quantiles as a, in addition to means. Um, apply every single one of those things to conformal prediction and then just basically read off what it gives us. Okay, so we're, we're not, you know, basically there's nothing left to prove. We've proven it in all of the lectures up until now. Note that maybe it's worth explicitly making this uh, observation, like conformal prediction just reduces, or the, what this non-conformity score is doing is it reduces this otherwise high dimensional problem of uh, finding a prediction set to the problem of just estimating quantiles of this one dimensional non-conformity score distribution. Okay, so this is this algorithm is just finding the empirical one minus delta quantile. And, um, you know, the reason it gives us a weak guarantee, a guarantee that's in expectation and a guarantee that uh, is only marginal is because it's only estimating, it's only getting marginal quantile consistency and expectation. But you know, like we know how to get high probability bounds for quantile estimation. We know how to get group conditional bounds for quantile estimation. We know how to get threshold calibrated bounds for uh, quantile estimation. We can do all of those things here and get correspondingly stronger bounds for conformal prediction. So let's just walk through that. So the first thing you might want to, um, you, the first thing you might want to strengthen about this is this in expectation part, right? Like how about if, if we're happy with sort of marginal coverage guarantees, we're happy with the coverage being 90% on average over examples, but we would like to actually have a way of producing prediction sets that we can be confident have those coverage guarantees, not just an expectation, but with high probability over our data set. Okay, well, that is nothing except a, you know, estimating tau in a way so that we know that tau satisfies marginal quantile consistency with high probability, which is something we've done. Okay. The algorithm is almost the same as this. So um, you know, it's, it's a matter only of changing um, sort of our, our um, it, you know, like the, the slack, it, how, how much we overestimate the quantile on the empirical distribution. So let's call this variant high probability split conformal prediction. And the only thing I'm going to change 
is what quantile, what, what quantile we estimate on the empirical distribution. Rather than estimating the one minus delta quantile, um, I'm gonna estimate the one minus delta plus square root of log two over gamma over two N that empirical quantile where gamma is gonna be like a high probability bound. Okay, so same algorithm as before, except we're gonna be a little more conservative when estimating the empirical quantile. You know, the empirical quantile won't be the one minus delta target quantile anymore. We'll shift it up rather, like before we were shifting it up by something that was smaller than one over N. Now we're shifting it up by something on the order of one over root N, which is sort of the standard deviation. That's how much we might expect the empirical quantile to deviate from the true distributional quantile in expectation. Okay, so what's the theorem? Fix any distribution. D over examples, any um, miscoverage rate, target miscoverage rate delta between zero and one, any nonconformity score. Function S mapping examples cross labels to real numbers. Um, and assume that um, the distribution on nonconformity scores when points are sampled from this distribution, D uh, is continuous. Again, this is just to make sure there's no ties in the empirical data set. And uh, if, you, if this isn't true already, if your non-conformity score distribution, it's true if you perturb the non-conformity scores by you know, an arbitrarily small amount of noise, so long as it's drawn from a continuous distribution. You just wiggle them around a little bit and, and all of a sudden there's no ties. Okay, so that's a mild assumption. Um, suppose our data set D consists of n points drawn IID from this underlying distribution. Um, then with probability one minus gamma, this is over the draw of the data set D and gamma can be an input to this algorithm because it does determine what margin we estimate our empirical quantiles on with probability one minus gamma. Um, the prediction set DD is function output by high probability split conformal satisfies that the probability on a new example drawn from the distribution that Y is covered by the prediction set on the one hand is at least the target coverage probability one minus delta. And on the other hand is at most one minus delta plus uh, two 
square root of log two over gamma over two n plus one over n. Okay, so same kind of theorem we had before, except um, now instead of a, a coverage guarantee that holds uh, in expectation over the data set, we have a coverage guarantee that holds with high probability over the data set uh, with probability one minus gamma. Um, the price we've paid for that is that the sort of degree to which we might overcover is now no longer like one over n, it's something on the order of one over root n. But that's sort of you know necessary because what we're doing is we're estimating a quantile with high probability and the empirical quantile might really differ from the true quantile by this much on, on the underlying distribution, right? And right, like the way to analyze this is, you, you know, like we proved in like the first or second lecture that you can apply turnoff bound or DKW inequality to relate empirical quantiles and true distributional quantiles. And the deviation, if you have N samples is, is this. Right, so we've just estimated the empirical quantile with the, that's sort of larger than the target that we want by um, an amount that upper bounds the with high probability the deviation between the empirical quantiles and the true quantile, and because uh, you know the deviation is less than this with probability one minus gamma. You know, like if the deviation is on the negative side, we still have coverage one minus delta because we've given ourselves a buffer of this amount. And if it's in the positive side, we've overcovered by at most twice that amount. Okay. And that's it, right? So it's it's almost the same thing, except now instead of just computing an expectation, we're computing like a high probability bound on the relationship between the empirical quantile and the target quantile. So if you need a high probability bound on your coverage rather than just an expectation bound, you can get it. Um, you know, the cost is you'll have sort of this one over root n uncertainty. Okay, so you know we've strengthened the the sort of in expectation part of the conformal prediction guarantee. How about the marginal part? Um, well, we know how to we know how to compute uh, quantiles in in ways that are stronger than marginal as well. So we can apply those techniques here. So for example, we could ask for, um, right, so, so let's say that this is a data set conditional bound, right, in that the standard conformal prediction bound holds in expectation over the data set. Since this holds with high probability, it holds with high probability conditioned on the data set. We can condition on more stuff. And so we might want to condition on the data set and groups. Right, so given some collection of groups, just as before, arbitrary subsets of the feature space that could intersect, we might want group conditional guarantees, right? So the probability that a new point sampled from the underlying distribution should be covered by the prediction set that we produce should be roughly equal to one minus delta, uh, even conditional on membership in some group G for all of the groups in this set that we care about, right? And remember, if the groups were disjoint, this would be easy. You would just separately run this procedure for each of the groups, but 
if the groups are intersecting, it doesn't that doesn't make sense. What do you do when someone shows up and they're a member of five groups? Okay. Um, but we can solve this problem too. It's going to require giving a somewhat more um, refined definition of what these prediction sets are. So these prediction sets in sort of standard split conformal prediction, they're defined by like a single threshold tau, right? No matter what the example is, we include all of the labels Y whose non-conformity score is less than tau. That's gonna be a problem if we want coverage um, conditional on groups because the non-conformity score distribution is gonna be different for different groups. And so if we wanna have 90% coverage for every group, we can't compare those non-conformity scores to the same threshold tau because these different non-conformity score distributions will not have the same 90th percentile quantile, okay? But um, we can define a class of prediction sets that are defined not by single threshold tau, but by functions whose job it is to predict quantiles as a function of x, okay? So, um, you know, given um, some function f mapping features to numbers that are supposed to predict quantile values, we can define the following family of prediction sets. Okay, that again are mappings from examples X to sets of labels. And we'll define them in the same spirit that we defined uh, our prediction sets previously, now parameterized by a function F. Our prediction set will contain all of the labels Y hat, such that the non-conformity score that we get when we plug in example X and candidate label Y hat, when this score is less than f of x. Okay, so it, rather than having a fixed threshold uh, that we compare everything to, we have a function mapping examples to thresholds and particular, in particular different uh, examples might get different thresholds. Okay, like again, prediction sets like this, parameterized like this, just have no hope of getting, uh, of being able to promise group conditional coverage because group conditional, you know, having one minus delta coverage for a set like that means that tau must be the one minus delta quantile of the non-conformity score distribution. And that just can't simultaneously be true for different distributions that have different quantiles. Okay, but conceivably we can get what we want from functions uh, F like this. Um, okay, and in fact, like, we know how to do this, right? Like, what is the guarantee that we need? We need that these functions f satisfy um, group conditional marginal quantile consistency, right? It should be that averaged over all of the non-conformity scores, um, conditional on membership in each group G, the fraction of the points whose labels fall below f of x should be one minus delta, should be the target quantile simultaneously for all of the groups G. That was just the condition that we previously called marginal quantile consistency. And so we can get um, group conditional conformal prediction sets um, by, by just outputting prediction sets like this for functions f that have been trained to be group conditionally uh, marginally quantile consistent on the non-conformity score distribution. Okay. So we know how to do that. Let's remind ourselves what the algorithm looks like. Let's call this uh, group split conformal.
So we've got some target quantile Q, which is one minus delta. So remember that the way we um, computed, I think actually we, we only did this for means in class for quantiles, it was in the notes. The way we computed a regression function that was group conditionally um, mean consistent was that we just solved um, a linear regression function, like we minimized squared error over linear combinations of the group indicator functions. Okay, now we didn't do it in class, but it was in the notes. Um, if you want to get group conditional quantile consistency, you do the same thing, but with pinball loss. You just minimize pinball loss over linear combinations of the group indicator functions. Okay. And to get generalization, we didn't have to do this for sort of, if, if we got to optimize directly over the distribution, but for generalization, the way we, the way we proved it is we solved this regression problem with a regularization term. Okay, and we, we do the same thing for quantiles. So we just let sigma star be the solution to the following optimization problem. Minimize overall lambda the expected value over the empirical distribution over D, the pinball loss targeting the qth quantile of this function f hat parameterized by lambda And what it's trying to predict here are the non-conformity scores, right? Because we want to estimate the quantiles of the non-conformity score distribution. Okay, and so that we can give an out-of-sample guarantee, this is a uh, L1 regularized regression problem. Okay, and what are these functions? F hat parameterized by lambda. I'll remember the function F hat of X parameterized by lambda is just the sum over all of the groups of lambda G times the group indicator function for that group. Okay, so we've got linear functions of the groups, by which I mean each function is a linear combination with parameters lambda of the group indicator functions. We are just solving the following convex optimization problem, minimize regularized pinball loss evaluated at the non-conformity scores uh, over, this, over this class of functions. Okay. That gives us some set of parameters, um, lambda star, and in particular, some function for predicting quantiles, we're just gonna output the prediction set uh, parameterized by that function. So we're just gonna output the prediction set parameterized by the function that we just solved for which is just always going to output the set of all labels whose non-conformity score is at most the quantile predicted by F at parameters lambda star. Okay.
Okay, so what's the guarantee that we get? So again, pick your favorite distribution, pick your favorite coverage rate, pick your favorite nonconformity score. Uh, we're going to have to assume, again, that the nonconformity scores are drawn from a continuous distribution. And remember, we need to assume stronger things as well now, uh, just as we did when we were studying marginal quantile consistency. So in particular, um, suppose the distribution is rho Lipschitz. That just means um, if I shift, you know, like a, a target, quant if, if I shift um, my predicted quantile by epsilon, I can't discontinuously change the coverage rate. It has to sort of change somewhat smoothly. Okay, so the distribution has to be rho Lipschitz. And in fact, um, For the generalization guarantee, we also need it to be sigma anti Lipschitz. Okay, which basically means that the CDF can't change too slowly or too quickly as I as I modify the, the point at which I'm evaluating it. Okay. Then with probability at least one minus gamma for any gamma. Prediction set output by this algorithm group split conformal. Um, satisfies that for any group, G in my collection of groups that isn't too small. Okay, so any group such that the mass of that group is at least alpha. We're not gonna promise anything for groups that are teeny tiny. If I look at the probability for a new example, that the label is in fact covered by my prediction set, not just marginally, but conditionally on membership in this group, that on the one hand, this is at least one minus delta minus square root alpha over the probability mass of the group. And on the other hand, is at most one minus delta plus the square root of alpha over the probability mass of the group, where alpha is the generalization bound we proved for a marginal quantile consistency, a group conditional marginal quantile consistency, which was something on the order of rho over square root of sigma times the square root of log one over gamma, plus G log N over N to the one fourth. Okay. Um, so maybe just to sort of, without dwelling too much on the constants, which like we have to just remember from previous lectures, let's just think about the form of this guarantee. Um, compared to the form of the guarantees we've been talking about so far. So previously, when we were talking purely about marginal guarantees, 
we asked for coverage that was at least one minus delta, and also that wasn't too much larger than one minus delta. It sort of was larger by one minus delta by an amount that sort of went down with n. Okay, which is the kind of thing we can ask for. And the way we did it is we sort of were conservative in our estimation of empirical quantiles. We didn't attempt to estimate the one minus delta quantile on the, uh, on the empirical distribution because we never wanted to undercover. We always overestimated. Okay. Now that doesn't exactly work for group conditional guarantees because what kind of estimation error can we expect for the quantiles of a particular group? Well, it's not going to go to zero with n, which is the size of the overall sample. It's going to go to zero as a function of the number of examples we've seen from that group. And these groups are of different sizes. And particular examples can be members of multiple groups. They can be members of big groups and small groups simultaneously. So it no longer makes sense to try to like conservatively estimate sort of upper bound, you know, conservatively estimate um, our empirical quantiles as a function of our empirical error on the groups that an example is a member of, because they might be examples of, they, they might be members of groups that are very big that for which we can expect, expect small error and groups that are very small for which maybe we can't get any non-trivial error bounds. Okay, so we're no longer trying to do that. Okay, we're just trying to estimate quantiles on the empirical distribution, and we're going to sometimes overcover and we're going to sometimes undercover. We're going to accept two-sided error bounds. That's sort of unavoidable. You can't do this conservative thing when the error bounds are necessarily different for different groups. And what we get is that we can, um, again, in sort of a finite sample way with high probability over the data set, um, so in a also data set conditional way, give these group conditional bounds where the coverage probability differs from our targets uh, by an amount that sort of goes to zero um, at a rate that depends on the size of the group. Okay, so you know, for a single point, we will give a single prediction set, but when you estimate the coverage rate of that prediction set over different groups that this point might be a member of, you will get different error bounds. And however way you evaluate it, remember you can simultaneously evaluate it um, on average over any of the groups that this point is a member of, that's the strength of group conditional guarantees, the error bounds will degrade with the size of that group. Okay, that's the form of the bound. Okay. Um, Let me maybe talk through the rest of the applications rather than writing them all on the board since we're approaching the end of the class and also, you know, what I would be writing on the board are just the algorithms that we've already derived throughout this class. And, and sort of talk about what you can get as you start asking for guarantees that are stronger than group conditional guarantees, like what happens if we ask for multi-calibrated guarantees? Like why would you wanna ask for multi-calibrated guarantees? These are guarantees that are sort of in this context, correct, not just conditional on the group, but conditional on the threshold chosen by F. Um, like why would you want that and how can you get it? And what we can say in the sequential setting. Okay. So, um, group conditional guarantees um, seem kind of nice, but it's it's still possible to cheat, or if you like, to fool yourself into thinking you're giving informative prediction intervals or prediction sets when you're not. Let's think about how that might work. Suppose I had the following kind of randomized algorithm. Okay, on a new example, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close my eyes, not even gonna look at it. I'm gonna flip a coin. It's gonna come up heads with probability one minus delta. And if it comes up heads, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna 
predict the set of all possible labels, the trivial prediction set. And if it comes up tails, what I'm going to do is I'm going to predict the empty prediction set, set that contains no labels. Okay. So first, this is like a super stupid thing to do. Like it's not informative at all. It's not help. Like whatever you wanted to do with your uncertainty quantification, this is not helpful to you. Like I've, I've not looked at the features. On the other hand, it does satisfy. Um, it, it does cover the labels of a one minus delta fraction of examples. In fact, it does so even conditional on group membership. In fact, it does so even like conditional on everything, right? Conditional on uh, your features, right? Like for you in particular, I can tell you that before I flip the coin, at least, I'm going to cover your label a one minus delta fraction of the time because I cover your label when the coin comes up heads because I predict all of the labels and I don't otherwise. Okay, so this is like not super useful, but satisfies these sort of group conditional kinds of coverage guarantees. And you don't even really need randomness, right? Like, you know, it doesn't literally have to be a stochastic process. Like, if somehow you are predicting the full prediction set on a one minus delta fraction of the examples and the empty prediction set on a delta fraction of the examples, and you're doing this um, across all of the groups, then uh, you'll satisfy these guarantees. Okay, so so. This is a way you could have cheated in regular conformal prediction, right? When we were just asking for marginal guarantees. And although asking for group conditional guarantees is asking for something stronger, it hasn't ruled out this, this particular way of cheating, right? It's possible to satisfy these guarantees without doing anything interesting. Okay. So like, what kind of condition could we write down to cause this not to be a solution to the problem, to sort of force the prediction sets to be informative? Well, one thing you might note is that like conditional on the head, on my coin coming up heads, conditional on me predicting um, the, the complete prediction set, um, I don't have my target 90% coverage. I have 100% coverage. And conditional on the coin coming up tails, conditional on predicting the empty set, um, I don't have 90% coverage. I have 0% coverage. Okay. Now, let's remember what these prediction sets look like in conformal prediction. How would I predict the um, trivial full prediction set? I would take tau to be very large, right? If the labels are between 0 and 1, or if the, if the nonconformity scores are between 0 and 1, I would take tau to be 1. How would I predict the empty prediction set? I would take tau to be 0. Okay? So what this is saying is that if I, if I attempted this sort of cheating strategy, then Although I would satisfy groupwise um, coverage, I would not satisfy my target coverage conditional on the value of the threshold. In particular, conditional on picking the threshold to be one. That's what I do for to get full coverage. I, I would I would have 100% coverage, which would deviate from my target. Conditional on picking the um, threshold to be zero, which corresponds to predicting the empty set, I would have 0% coverage. So my prediction set would have groupwise coverage, but it would not be threshold calibrated. It wouldn't be correct conditional on the threshold. So one thing I can do to sort of ensure that my prediction sets are informative, that sort of sidestep this cheating strategy, is I can ask for what I'll call multi-valid coverage. Coverage that is valid, conditional not just on membership in a group, but also conditional on the value of f of x, conditional on the threshold I've predicted. Okay? If I do that, like, like what it means is that I have 90% coverage, right, not just for people in your group, but for people in your group for whom I predicted, for whom I used a prediction set that had threshold 0.7. And it means that, like, I can't use this strategy of trying to get 90% coverage by randomizing or otherwise choosing thresholds that sometimes get 100% coverage and sometimes get 70% coverage, right? It has to be that I get the correct coverage at every level set of, of my prediction F, okay? Um, okay, and we know how to do that too, because if we want these prediction sets that are parametrized 
by functions f to have the correct coverage conditional on group membership and conditional on the value of f. That just means that we want f to estimate quantiles of the nonconformity square distribution in a way that is quantile multi-calibrated, right? That just means the quantiles should be correct, conditional on the group and conditional on the predicted threshold. So if you just swap out the algorithm for um, computing group conditional quantile consistent F for the algorithm we gave for computing um, quantile multi-calibrated functions F, then you get a corresponding theorem that um, gives you coverage, not just conditional on group membership, but conditional on the threshold itself, which, which, which finally rules out this kind of uninformative cheating strategy. Just to sort of convince yourself that, right, right so, so like what was especially bad about this cheating strategy? Like it didn't look at the data at all, right? Like it, um, so just to convince yourself that there's not some other correspondingly dumb strategy that will give you um, quantile calibrated coverage in the way that we can now ask for, um, maybe consider the following example. So suppose we're in a regression setting, okay? Labels in principle can range between zero and one. But in fact, for our distribution, the labels are always um, in some interval zero to epsilon, okay? If we just wanted like marginal or group conditional coverage, what we would be doing is, you know, a one minus delta fraction of the time, we would be predicting like an interval that had width one and a delta fraction of the time predicting the empty interval and our average prediction interval width would be terrible. It would be like, you know, one minus delta when if only we knew the true distribution there, you know, we know that there exists prediction intervals that have average width like at most epsilon because all of the action in the label distribution is actually in this interval of at most epsilon. Um, okay, now suppose like our regression function always predicts zero and our non-conformity score function is just, you know, like distance from zero, okay? Any like multi-valid set of prediction sets um, must have an average width at most epsilon, right? Because if it has, you know, if, if the width, if the average width is substantially bigger than epsilon, it must often be predicting things that have 100% coverage, right? Because anytime you predict an interval that has width greater than epsilon, it has 100% coverage. And those prediction sets would not have the target coverage rate, like conditional on their width, conditional on the threshold. And so when we ask for threshold calibrated coverage, um, we require in this sense that the, the prediction sets actually be informative. Like you, it is impossible to satisfy this guarantee without knowing something about the actual um, quantiles of the nonconformity score distribution. Okay, so we can satisfy that by just swapping this algorithm out for our iterative algorithm for coming up with quantile multi-calibrated, um, quantile multi-calibrated um, predictors, thank you. Um, okay. All of this is assuming that the data is drawn IID from some distribution, or at least from, you know, comes from an exchangeable distribution. Okay, so it's assuming that we've got this calibration set of labeled data. And then we're gonna make predictions in the future on data that looks like the data we've seen before, right? All of these guarantees are predicated on that. But we can also define conformal prediction in a sequential adversarial setting. What would that mean? It would mean every day we are faced with an example X. We have to produce a prediction set for that example X, a set of labels, okay? And then only then do we learn the label. And it might be that there's an adversary, you know, the data is not drawn from a distribution, right? It might be that there's an adversary that is choosing the examples X on the label Y every day, okay? Or, you know, if we don't believe in adversaries, 
maybe at least we believe in distribution shift. Maybe, you know, there is some, you know, like non-adversarial process that's generating these examples, but we don't know what it is and it's changing over time. It's time series data. We can nevertheless, like we can ask for an algorithm that makes predictions sequentially, produces prediction sets sequentially that empirically at the end of time has 90% coverage, uh, right? 90% of the time should have covered the label it was given by the adversary. Okay, and we can ask for these kinds of guarantees group conditionally. We can ask for them in a threshold calibrated way. We can ask for all of these things in the online adversarial setting, just as we can in the batch setting. Okay, and remember, if we use prediction sets defined this way, getting 90% coverage is the same thing as um, predicting quantiles correctly in a sequential setting. 90% marginal coverage just means that for 90% of our examples, our predicted quantile should actually be above the um, actual nonconformity score. Group conditional coverage just means on the subsequence defined by members of each group, um, we should have predicted a target quantile. Sorry, we should have predicted a value that was above the nonconformity score 90% of the time. For uh, multi calibrated coverage, it should be that on the subsequence defined by members of a group and um, particular predicted quantile values of our algorithm, we should have. Um, we should have predicted something above the nonconformity score 90% of the time. And again, we know how to do all of that, right? We've given algorithms in the adversarial sequential setting that have quantile multi-calibrated guarantees, okay? Which means, oh, and, and also simpler algorithms that have weaker guarantees, like just marginal quantile consistency in the online setting. Which means that in the online setting, in the online sequential adversarial setting, we can recover all of these same conformal prediction bounds, but without needing to assume that the data came from any kind of well-behaved distribution. The one caveat is that like, if we get to assume the data came from a well-behaved distribution, these algorithms give us ways to produce prediction sets at test time when we don't have any labels at test time. Whereas implicit in this sequential adversarial setting is that after we make a prediction, we learn, well, in the, in the, in the quantile setting, we learn the label. Here, you know, we need to learn the non-conformity score for the label in order to run these algorithms. So there's a trade-off. On the one hand, in the sequential setting, we don't need to assume anything about the data distribution. But on the other hand, these algorithms only make sense when you have access to labels at test time. Natalie. Well, I get the intuition for how this one minus delta, um, like for asking for exactly that, like maybe suggest that it's informative. And then also the other thing you said about how like, okay, here's one way you could cheat. Like we'll stop that by doing this. Here's another way we'll stop that by doing this, right? Um, but is there some sort of like a like a proof that says like, okay, once you have all these things, like, like I guess, it, is there some sort of metric that we can use to directly measure the informativeness that we're getting at? Let's see. So if we talk about the expected size, for example. Yeah. So, so like here's one thing you could here here's one ambitious thing you could ask for. Okay, you could say, look, um so, so, so in general. In general, you might want to compete with sort of the true conditional label distribution. Like suppose you actually knew for every feature X what the actual distribution on labels was. If you did know that, then you could come up with the smallest possible prediction set that had the right coverage probability. You would just sort of greedily start including labels from most likely to least until you covered 90% of the label mass. That's the best you could possibly do. And in general, um, it's too much to ask for to compete with that because the true the true label distribution might just be really complicated more than whatever your you know learning methods can express. Um, okay, but still, like maybe that's one thing you could ask to compete with. Now, 
when we talk about things like multi-calibration, we're sort of trying to like get closer to that. We're sort of saying, okay, you know, marginal guarantees are very weak. Like what if I ask for guarantees conditional on all of these things? Um, but unless you tell me something about the structure of the groups that I'm asking for conditional guarantees with respect to, I'm not necessarily getting any closer to like the truth in that you know, let's think about the case of just sort of um, mean estimation. Like what, what's the probability it's going to like rain tomorrow? That can be calibrated just by predicting um, the, you know, it, just by looking at the average propensity of rain in Philadelphia, say it's like 10% and just predicting 10% every day. Okay, that's not a, that, you know, that's not a very good prediction because that's not taking into account any meteorological information. But, you know, if you just ask for multi-calibration with respect to random subsets of days in ways that don't correlate with like meteorological conditions, I won't, you won't be forcing me to get any more accurate. Like, because if, if it rains 10% of days, it'll also rain roughly 10% of any random subset of days, right? So if you just ask for like multi-calibration with respect to like a bunch of random groups, it's not getting me any closer to accuracy. Now, you could ask the question, when is it that multi-calibration with respect to some group structure G forces me to be accurate? So going back to your original question, you know, if I'm just gonna promise like group conditional consistency, can you say something about the um, structure of the groups such that that implies I have to be getting close to these optimal prediction intervals that I would get if I actually knew the true underlying label distribution? Um, and you can write down conditions under which that's true. And maybe I'm, I'll ask Jess to tell us about that in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good question. Okay. Um, all right, that's it.